just a, a couple minutes ago about that missions moments. It's like we we just belittle sin. Like we glorify sin like it's some good thing. Like like we'd say like chocolate and desserts, it's like sinfully good. You know, like we like take that word and we make it like this good thing. We we are excited about the wrongdoings that we do so often, right? Um, so I want to unpack this just for a second, guys. Sin is a, it's a pretty complicated word. So maybe I'll make a comparison to the word church. If I say the word church and it has a small c, what does that mean? Like a bill, yeah, the local church. Colonial is a church, right? There's a church here, there's a church there, there's a church there. Okay, that's little church. Okay, then there's capital C church. What does that mean? Yes. The, yeah, exactly. The global, the big, the people of God. Like, it's the really big one. Okay, so now let's use that with sin. There's sin is both individual, but it's also total. So, individual sin, think of it like this. All of us individually do bad things, right? Sin, on an individual level, I sin. Corey sins. I do bad things. I lie. I cheat. I steal. Like, I do wrong things. I sin. Those are acts. The wrongdoings that I do, that's an individual level. But also, in Romans 5, 19, there it is. There's also a totality of sin on the individual level, level that I want to, to look at this for a second. So number one, we know we sin, we do bad things. So when I talk about sinning, I do a bad thing. You guys understand that, right? That's a, that's a behavioral act. But there's so much more to that. There's a, a sin that stains us on a deeper level. Because Adam and Eve sinned, we are stained with capital S. We have little s, individual s. We have capital S, big X. And here, here it is. Romans 5, 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam. He's talking about Adam and Eve. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many were made righteous. He's talking about Jesus. So, let me, let me say this. Adam sinned a small s. But with that sin came big S. This idea that things die, that creation is no longer perfect, there's not this shalom, right? You guys, you guys see what I'm saying? Um, and he's, and uh, Paul is making this point here in Romans. He's saying, Adam sinned, and now all of us have this capital S sin principle within us. So the moment I'm born, I'm stained by capital S sin. Just like just like I take on the inheritance, like I can't do anything about it. My last name is Osmond. I was born in Osmond. I don't really have much say into the history of Osmonds. But I know that because I'm born, the second I'm born into this world, I'm an Osmond. Right? I take on the characteristic of that before what was before me. My mom, when she was in high school, almost got into a car. She was invited to this like party or something. Almost got into a car, decided not to, and went home. And everyone in that car actually died in a car accident. Like that, that, like that drive, right? If my mom would have stepped in there and died, I would not be. It, like you, you see what I mean? Like who I am is is tied to this like overarching definition of who I am. So I step into a reality that's marked by capital S sin. I myself am stained by sin, and that's why I do the little s. Like I'm not a sinner because I cheat, steal, and lie. I cheat, steal, and lie because I'm marked by sin. You get what I'm saying. Uh, that, guys, is on the individual level. But there's also something bigger. There's a total all creation level. Let's go to Romans 8, 18 through 25. I bet you guys ever read this. You kind of skimmed, skimmed over it because it made no sense whatsoever in your mind. Look at Romans 8, 18 through 25. Okay, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Okay. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. We were saved. Actually, I'm going to stop it. Um, we can go on. Okay. Have any idea what that means? What the 
heck? All creation thrones? I don't understand. All right, let's look at the little s and big s when it comes to creation. Little s. I bought some trees. Uh, my mother-in-law actually bought some trees to put in our backyard a couple years ago, right? They like to plant trees because there was nothing back there. And so I, I get my friend John Crater, and we go and we plant a couple of trees. Well, Crater dug his holes deep enough so that, or not too deep, but he made it so that the roots could grow and survive. Corey dug too deep, and I dug like a foot too, and so when I put the tree down, it's like, you're supposed to be above the ground. And so about, I don't know, a month later, we noticed John's trees have leaves. Corey's tree does not. So that, <laughs> that tree is dead. That individual tree is dead. Little s, dead. Right? But here's the thing with the big s, is that trees die. You know what I'm saying? You think that there were dead trees in the Garden of Eden? No. There were dead trees in the Garden of Eden because life and wholeness and creation, shalom was present. But there's no individual dead tree. That all creation, as it says in Romans 8, groans for a day when there will be no death on this planet or in creation. You guys get that picture? But like Paul is unpacking the gospel for us that's so much bigger than just I pray a prayer and individually I'm saved. He says, no, it's bigger than you, man. Like the entire creation longs for a day that they won't it won't be done. It's like it's like we took Eden and I mean and we we killed it. We, we gutted it and creation's longing for that day that it's Eden. Yeah? It's a big, big, big deal. In the West we don't talk about that. In the West we talk about I say prayer. You know, and I, we talk about just the individual side, but man, sin is so much bigger than that. Like, it, it ruined everything. It ruined everything. Sin ruined everything. I'm marked by it. I'm defined by it. I'm born into it. And without Jesus, I have no hope from it. And creation is the exact same way. Creation was beautiful, it was perfect, it's whole, and without Jesus, Creation has no hope. No matter how many Earth Days we do or whatever, there is no hope for creation without Jesus. Okay? That's what... That's, yeah. That um, leads us into... What is the mission of God? To make all things right. So maybe... So on an individual level, what does that mean? I'm asking you guys. But God's mission is to make all things right. What does that mean for you as an individual? What does that mean for you as an individual that God's making all things right? Awesome. Yeah. A follower of Jesus. What else? And specifically, like with the sin that we were born into, what does that mean to be a follower of Jesus to make things, the mission of God is to make things right, and we are born into sin? We strive to follow Jesus and not sin. Okay? Yeah, we strive to be marked by. But what else? Like, what happens? What happens when we talk about like conversion, which is a horrible word, when we talk about like becoming a follower of Jesus, what happens inwardly inside of us? Sin is reconciled. Yeah. Sin is reconciled. Guys, that's why like we say, man, I'm a sinner. All I know is sin. I have no hope without Jesus. I am dead in my transgressions. Read Ephesians 2. I am dead in my transgressions. Because of Jesus, I'm made alive. He took that sin principle that was in me and destroyed it and reconciled himself to me. Because that's what it means on an individual level. What about on a big picture level? Right? Like what does that mean? Um, and so last week, actually, we talked a little bit about the purpose of being a follower of Jesus, right? Like, we looked at when Jesus called the first disciples, and he said, hey, follow me, and you become fishers of men. And then, uh, and we're like, man, what does that mean? And Jesus was calling all of us into relationship with Jesus, but when he does that, he calls us to be a part of the mission to make all things right. That's what we talked about last week. This week, I'm unpacking a little bit more the mission is. And I want to do that by looking at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. So how do we participate in the mission of God? Both on a small level and a big level. You guys with me? Are you tired? Are you good? Okay, awesome. Beautiful. Second Corinthians 5. If you're tired, it's okay. Push through. This is so important. This is the gospel. This is everything. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. You were marked by sin. 
Jesus made you new. You're no longer marked by a capital S sin. You're marked by Jesus who, who destroyed sin and rose again. Like, that's what my identity is. All right, verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness yeah. Okay, why don't you go back to the first slide there? What does that mean? What is what's that word that keeps popping up? Reconcile. Tell me what that means. What does it mean to be reconciled? To make right. To be made right. Whoa, wait, wait a second, wait a second. So I just said the mess the, the mission of God is to what? To make right. all things right. And then we just said, okay, so what does this look like? You are about to you're, you are supposed to be about reconciliation which Casey just tell, told us, means to make things right. So if I have a really big fight with my wife, right, and then it's like, man, I really feel like I need to reconcile, what does that mean? Make, make right. things right. I go apologize. So this is generally my fault. And I will go and I will apologize, and it'll, you know, it's all happy, we hug, boom, reconcile, right? Um, okay. And then what if, okay, if I'm not right with God, what does that mean? Man, I confess my sins. Right? I confess my sins. I say, I'm, like, I'm broken. I've strayed from you, Jesus. And I talk about reconciliation. That's the gospel. But then he says even more. He says, and you are to be about the ministry of reconciliation. So not only is it between me and God, he's like, okay, now you are about to be a part of that work. Right? So now, Colby, jump on board. We're going to freaking be about this mission together. Right? That's God talking. That's awesome. <laughs> not me talking. So now, Colby jumps on board this mission. As, as I'm being reconciled to God, and God has reconciled the world to himself, he says, okay, now you come and be about that same message of reconciliation. It's why we do missions moments. Right? You have that missions moments slide. I want, to, I want you guys to see this. Look at all the realms around the circle of missions moments. Right? We are about God's mission. And the extracurricular activities we do at work, at home, with our family, with our friends, at Revolution, and other question marks. Uh, we, do you guys see the holistic picture of reconciliation? That you guys are invited into this ministry of reconciliation to proclaim both on an individual level, we're sinners. You're a sinner. You need to like we need to repent and follow Jesus. At the same time, when you're feeding the poor, man, isn't that about reconciliation? Like, man, when you when you go to Mission Southside, when you go to Haiti and you get to participate in orphan care, guys, like, that is, that's reconciling work. Is that you are about God's reconciliation to those people as well. But do not miss this. This is very important. You can do all those things and not be about Jesus at all. And I will tell you, all attempts at reconciling outside of Jesus is very temporary. If we try to reconcile outside of Jesus, we eventually die. Right? And there's not long-term reconciliation. We have any hope for this world. We have any hope that poverty won't exist, orphans won't exist, um, all, all of the bad things. If we have hope that they won't exist someday, then we have to hope in Jesus. We have to, because the trajectory of that is that. Right? The trajectory of Jesus is life. See that? See that? Um, we are, guys, we get to be about this holistic picture of reconciliation. It's so much bigger than saying a prayer. But at the same time, like, the number one thing we need to reconcile with is God. So if we're sick, like, if you guys have never thought about it that way, if you just go to church and do your churchy thing, it's like, yeah, I don't know if I can reconcile with God. I would say start there. <laughs> like, start there. It's like, God, it's like, am I forgiven? Am I, like, is my life like, is my old life dead? My new life, you know what I mean? Like, you start there. If you just try to go to Haiti or try to go to revolution and all those things to, to be about reconciliation with others, I mean, that's good stuff, but without Jesus, those things die, right? So, just saying that. We get to understand an awesome picture of the mission of God, to make all things right. We get to be a part of that mission to make all things right. All right, last verse I want to look at is Mark 1, 14 through 15, and this will lead us into the next week. Alright, 
some of you guys hopefully might remember this. Uh, we talked about this at home churches, I think, <laughs> last year. Um, but there's a story of this famous pastor who just passed away recently in Dallas, Florida. He was leading a conference with a bunch of pastors. And he asked a question to all these pastors. He said, what, according to Jesus, is the gospel? That was the question he asked the pastors. What is the gospel in Jesus' own words? And they would say a lot of random Bible verses, a lot of answers, right? And Dallas was like, nope, wrong, nope, wrong, nope. He's like, turn to Mark 1, 14, 15. So this is what we're doing. This is the gospel in the words of Jesus Christ. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. You, you know what the good news, what that word is, good news? Gospel. That's the same word. You're in Galilee in the Greek. He's proclaiming the gospel of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel. This is what, so according to that sentence, he said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe that gospel, this gospel. What is the sentence that, according to Jesus, is the gospel? The kingdom of God is near. According to Jesus, is the gospel message. So what does that mean? In light of everything we just talked about, the mission of God and sin, little s, big s, tell me what that means. Five Jesus points. I can't that's Five, uh, I'll find you a lollipop. I'll give you a lollipop. What does that mean? I want to hear a couple thoughts. What does it mean that the gospel is that the kingdom of God has come here? I, yeah, wait. It's like big G world gospel instead of like little G person gospel. All right. Absolutely. Little G could be in big G though, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That makes sense to wave nine. What about the rest of you? It's like, wait, you're like, what does that mean? Wait, not yet. We're, we're talking to each other. Excuse my language. Little G, big G. What about the rest of you guys? Like, what does that mean? The kingdom of God has come near. How is that the gospel? What does that look like in my life when we talk about that? Be bold. You won't think you're stupid. I'm literally bribing you with lollipops. What does it mean? I want to hear the answer. You've got your real answer, but if you're going to have an attempt at a real answer, yes. Okay. Share the story of God. You have to wait. Give it to me. Say it one more time. Got it. Okay, so if we say the kingdom of God has come near, I'm saying what is that sentence? And you said to share the kingdom of God. Okay. What are you sharing? Okay. What story? Keep going. Okay, well, and what's the gospel? The kingdom of God is in you. What does that mean? What does that mean? No. I don't know. Okay. Here, take my lollipop. Take my lollipop. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I don't promote that. All right, one more. I got one more lollipop. Yeah. Um, I'm back for it. I'd say maybe the kingdom of God is come near because the Bible is near us. Hey. <laughs> the Bible is near us. So that's correct. I'll stop there as far as correct is. Yeah. I, want to, I want that lollipop back. Thank you but thank you for your bold. You're bold. Alright, you guys, can you pay attention for the next minute? I'm going to tell you what I think is. And then you can bite her lollipop. Okay. If the world is marked by capital S sin. All of creation, in, as well as us individually, are marked by this sin. The language there we could say is that there's a new kingdom of sin. Right? That makes sense? There is a kingdom. So if Eden was like a kingdom that was marked by only shalom and good things. Sin came. Big S came. Suddenly, that is a kingdom marked by death. You guys get that? Jesus says, here's the good news. The kingdom, of, I am the king, I bring this kingdom of God is near. Meaning that this, which was marked by big S, will not win. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the 
his kingdom will dominate this kingdom. Yes. Preach it, right? Amen. Right? That's awesome. That's great news. There will someday be no Sarah McLaughlin videos with puppies because we know that someday Jesus is coming back. He's going to make all things new. And in the very presence of Jesus, right, we begin to see that reconciliation. Right? He came at, at first, he, said, you know, he dies for our sins so we can be reconciled to him. And then he releases us to ministry of reconciliation that our life has purpose because we get to think about that. And someday we have to point to the fact that Jesus will come back and finish it. He will finish what he started. Right? That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's unbelievably good news. Instead of, oh, that's good news. Yeah, I pray to pray once and now I go to church. It's like, that's not good news. Good news is that all the things that are dead in this world will like, have a hope. Like, I have hope. We all have hope because of Jesus. So next week, this is what we're going to do. Next week we're going to look at that further. Um, Matt Chandler has a book called The Explicit Gospel. We're going to use that a little bit this semester. And it's, it, he, he uses this language. He says there's the gospel on the ground and the gospel in the air. The gospel on the ground is like individual sin. I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God. I need to be reconciled. And then he's like, gospel in the air is like big, all of creation. Like, all of creation is reconciled. So that's, we're going to talk about that for the rest of the semester. What does it mean to, to know the gospel on the ground and know the gospel in the air? Awesome. I'm going to pray. Um, Jesus, we give you thanks, God, that we have hope. We give you thanks that you are a God who, is, who, who wins. Jesus, that like, we can be on your side, not to win arguments, God, but to win people into your kingdom. Jesus, would you, um, first and foremost, is us in this room who doesn't know what it means to be reconciled to you, Jesus, would you be so good? And God, would you empower us and the rest of us to be ministers of reconciliation? God, I, I pray for our Wednesday night home churches, that we would have a, a mission purpose to them, that we want people to be involved to hear about their gospel. Jesus, I just pray that you would um, inspire us and unleash us and send us out so that every Sunday we would have the amount of missions moments that we have. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Amen. Awesome.